please welcome tonight's moderator, former news anchor for KCR TV, current communications director at UC Davis School of Law, and contributing host for Capital Public Radio, Miss Pamela Wu. Thank you very much for joining us for an evening featuring Madeline Levine, presented by the Davis Parent University Lecture Series. Dr. Levine's work first uh, came to my attention last summer when her opinion column, Raising Successful Children, topped the list of most emailed articles on the New York Times website. I was among those who emailed it, and perhaps you were as well. Um, as some of you may know from my past participation in this series, I'm relatively new to parenthood. My son, Eric, recently turned two. But already I feel the anxiety that um, I presume many of you must feel about doing the right thing to parent correctly, to shape his future and help assure his success. I wonder if I'm praising him too much or too little. I stress out over whether I'm supposed to be reading to him or giving him unstructured playtime and over how many carefully calculated minutes of each activity I should be doing, which is kind of crazy because he's not taking the SATs. He's stacking blocks and wiping his hands on our cat. But where do you find the balance between overparenting and underparenting? See, in my mind, because I'm kind of a person of extremes, the choices play out like these quotes that I found on this great humor website called Tiger Mom Says. Tiger Mom Says, plenty of time to enjoy life after Harvard. And by Harvard, I mean Harvard Med. Permissive Mom Says, you did your best. Who wants ice cream? Let's go visit your uncles Ben and Jerry. Tiger Mom Says, we didn't name you Stanford for nothing. <laughs> Permissive mom says, C's still get degrees. <laughs> this one's my favorite. Tiger mom says, you want playtime? OK, time to play violin. <laughs> Madeline Levine is here to help us through these artificial choices. And that's really what they are, artificial choices between overparenting and underparenting. And to help us find balance in our quest to raise independent, joyful, well-adjusted young people. First, though, it does take a community to support the well-being of every child, so I would like to recognize our community sponsors and leaders for partnering with Parent Education K-12. through Please stand up so that you may be recognized. Chad DeMossi of Coldwell Banker. <laughs> Dr. Steve Nowicki of Davis Pediatrics Group. Pam Mari and Kate Snow of DJUSD. <laughs> School board members Susan Levenberg and Gina DeLayden. <laughs> Trace Peterson of the Davis Police Department. <laughs> and Ann Bellamy of the Davis Enterprise. Thank you to our partners for your support. Now, it is my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Madeline Levine. Dr. Levine has over 25 years of experience as a psychologist, consultant, and educator. Her best-selling book, The Price of Privilege, explores the reasons why teenagers from more affluent families are experiencing epidemic rates of emotional problems. Her more recently published book, Teach Your Children Well, was the DJUSD and community-wide K-12 Parent Ed Collaborative's book pick for the current school year. Dr. Levine began her career as an elementary and junior high school teacher in the South Bronx of New York before coming here to California to pursue her education and career in psychology. She is a co-founder of Challenge Success, a program founded at the Stanford School of Education that addresses education reform and student well-being. She is featured in the education documentary Race to Nowhere, and she's a go-to person for journalists across the country who are seeking expert sources on education and parenting. She lives outside San Francisco with her husband and is the proud mother of what she likes to call three newly minted adult sons. Please welcome to Davis Parent University, Dr. Madeline Levine. Whoa. 
that's loud. And, oh, thank God they took my picture off. That was just like creeping me out because, you know, my son took that actually, my middle son, who you'll hear about, but it was clearly airbrushed and so um, it's like, <laughs> okay. Anyway, you probably can't see what I've written up here. Um, and the reason I've done it is because it's really mostly for me because I tend to wander, if you've seen me speak before, and um, I end up talking about, uh, you know, the fiscal cliff or Hillary Clinton or, so, you know, the snowstorm in the east. I don't want to do that. So this keeps me focused. Um, this is my favorite little graphic. It's by Dimitri Martin, um, who I like. He's a comedian. And when he writes about success, he says, this is what people think success looks like, you know, straight line, meaning you went to the right private school and then you went to Harvard and then you got your MBA from Duke or, and then you worked for Goldman Sachs and you lived happily ever after. And that is um, a story that shockingly I hear in my office often. So I'll have an eight-year-old boy on the couch and I'll ask him what he wants to be when he grows up and he'll tell me that he wants to be a venture capitalist. Um, and I tell him to go find a frog, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like, um, and, the, and the scarier thing is, is the 10-year-old girl on my couch who tells me she wants to marry a venture capitalist. So um, this is a, a, a version of success. And this is what I think success actually looks like. It's a little hard for me to see, but I'm curious. Uh, we have a pretty big audience here. I am terrible with numbers. Can, how, ma how many people does the auditorium hold? Any idea? 500 people or so? Okay, so how many of you have followed the straight and narrow path? How many of you went to the right schools, um, the right graduate degree, got the right job, and, you know, basically, no, yeah, let her raise her hand herself. <laughs> Come on, we're being honest. How many people? There's always people who did that. Okay, I, I've got three like down in their lap there. Any, three. Anybody here? No, nobody on this side. It's all on that side. Okay. You're in a cluster, you three, right over there. Right over there. Um, the reality is that some kids actually do manage that just fine. They fly through. They're not stressed. They manage all that stuff, and they. Um, and you can say success was a straight line for them. Uh, is there any way to lower that just a little bit? Um, if, if anybody out there hears me, lower it a little bit. Okay, so that's three out of 500. Um, so another numbers person. What percentage is that? Uh, kind of about? Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Okay. Okay, so that leaves... 99% of us who have followed a different route to success. And I, and I actually think that one of the greatest secrets that adults keep from children is that fact. Um, that in, in reality, in real life, you don't have to be a straight A student, right? If you take a minute and think about the things that you are profoundly good at, um, when I think about it, I, you know, this is easy. I love doing this. I like speaking. I write pretty well. I think I was a good mom. Those are the things I think I was really outstanding at, three things. And then um, Susan Lo Lo Lovinger? Lo I only asked you three times. Um, <laughs> was so kind uh, to walk me to the bathroom because I have very impaired visual spatial relationships. I was at Nutrier on the North Shore of Chicago uh, very recently and they sent me to the bathroom alone and 40 minutes later they found me in the boiler room downstairs. <laughs> so a whole auditorium like this waiting because, and I think that's the case for everybody or almost everybody that we have things that we're very strong in, things that we kind of suck at, and a whole bunch of things that we're very average at. And if my kids were here, they would be sure to tell you about the time that they asked for a hard-boiled egg. So I took the eggs in the shell and I put them in the microwave. Um, and yeah, uh, that was a mess, actually. Um, so like, when you go home, give that some thought. 
in your own life, how many things that you're really extraordinary at. Uh, the Gallup poll just came out with some fascinating research on um, the people who had risen to the top CEO, top managers, CEO, CFO, COOs, and out of 32 variables, how many they had to be outstanding at. And outstanding was defined as in the 90th percentile above of their peer group. And the 32 variables were everything from content, you know, really knows their stuff, content-based things, to good communication skills, the span, the range. To be a top corporate manager, how many of those 32 variables do you think you had to be, be in the 90th percentile at? Three. Okay, anybody else? Ten. Ten. One. One. Three, to, three to five. Three to five. Le leaving, again, numbers, somebody else doing for me. Um, <laughs> leaving uh, a whole bunch of things that even the top people weren't really very good at. And kids in my office are devastated if they have like four A's and a C. Or if a parent comes to see me, they're never coming to see me about the four A's, they're coming to see me about the C. And what I'm about to say you may agree or disagree with, and we can have a conversation about it afterwards. I think we spend too much time worrying about our kids' deficits and not enough time helping them cultivate their strengths. Because in real life, um, I'm a basketball fan, you know, you go to your right. You go to the things that you're strong at. And so for most kids, if they're getting A's in English and C's in math, um, they're probably going to end up doing something with language. Uh, in, in the same way that, you know, I depend on the kindness of strangers to help me with visual spatial or with um, figuring out less than 1%. Um, and if a lot of my education had been trying to correct that deficit, I don't think I would have gotten to be a writer and a speaker and do what I did. So um, this tremendous anxiety about my kid is not performing at the same level in something or another is so heightened. Um, I was at the Hill Schools in New York, um, for the, that's Fieldston and Riverside and Horace Mann, and we're on the wrong profession. A tutor there is $1,000 an hour. And I didn't believe it. This, I was told this in these little focus groups I was doing, so I spoke to the headmasters, and in fact, that's accurate. It's $1,000 an hour, not for everybody, but the top tutors are. And who do you think they're tutoring? The kids who need help or, or not? <laughs> not. They're tutoring the A minus student, sometimes the B plus student, but the student who's almost perfect and the parents is really worried that that B plus or A minus is going to ruin their chances to get into a very prestigious school. Um, so I think kids could use a dose of reality about what the real world is like and the fact that um, you don't have to be good at everything. Um, because, because that's kind of the definition of success, this sort of narrow definition, and it's all metric-based, you know, like what's your GPA and what's your SAT score and um, uh, how much money do you make. A um, lot of materialism. I was just in New York, and it was just so interesting. I was walking down Fifth Avenue, and I passed the Gucci store, and in the window, there is nothing but a shoe, a single shoe on a platform, not a platform shoe, a shoe on a platform, <laughs> with like lights on it, you know, like, like it looks like an altar basically. <laughs> and, and it is, it is, that, that's the point. It's supposed to be iconic. It's supposed to be something to be worshiped. Um, and I like nice shoes as much as the next gal, but that, you know, that's not the point. The point is that kids at the youngest ages now are talking to me about their need for material goods and their need to make a lot of money. Um, and there are many problems with that in terms of values, but there's also a big problem with that in terms of what gets pushed aside for children. So if you're a young kid and you're very worried about whether or not you're going to get into Harvard. I, um, I was at a, a preschool recently and a little kid is pulling on my pants and pulling on my pants and adorable, you know, and I get down to talk to him and I said, what, what did you want, honey? And he goes, I want to go to Harvard. <laughs> and 
Um, I said, really? How do you know about it? And he said, well, I'm taking Manchurian, so, you know, in a child's voice, so that I can go to Harvard. Now, his taking Manchurian may or may not be a good idea, but, but for that three or four year old child whose real task is things like self-control, um, not hitting his friend over the head in, you know, in, the, in the playground, learning how to sit still so he can go on to kindergarten, you know, five days a week of learning a foreign language may not be the best use of his time. It may be, but it may not be. And, and I think, you know, I know there's concern about how many extracurriculars things kids are involved in, but I'd like you to remember how tough growing up was, which we forget. We forget what it was like to be young and have nobody sit with you at the table or wake up to a, an absolutely foreign body every day, literally foreign body every day. I mean, those are the things that we forget about. And to, when, I, when I was listening to Pamela talking about all the stress, it's like that's not what childhood is supposed to be. Childhood needs this big space of time so that kids can figure out many things, but the, the two major tests of childhood are friendships and exploration. And, and so, you know, specialized camps, um, constant tutoring, traveling teams, I'll talk more about, I don't like any of those things for kids because I think they get in the way of what the developmental task is. If you've been on a traveling team from the time you were seven for soccer, you're never going to know if lacrosse was really your game. And, and that's, that's the period of time where kids have the ability to explore that way. Um, there's a reason why this is a narrow definition of success, and that's because parents are very anxious, right, as we heard from Pamela. Is it enough? Is it too much? You know, um, did I buy the right toys? You're, first of all, you're never going to get it right, so let's start with that. Um, and, and I want you to hear one thing that's really important to me when I speak, and that's that I don't know your child, your particular child. And so you can listen to me or other child developmental experts or educational experts. And, you know, we have research behind us, and I certainly believe what I have to say. And it's true in general, but it may not be true for your particular child. And your greatest job is to know your own child profoundly and deeply so that you can filter what I have to say through the reality of who your kid is. Every child is different. Um, but, we're ner but we are nervous, and we're nervous as a group. Um, why are we so nervous? Well, we have some good reasons to be nervous. We have a terrible economy, right? Um, I have three newly minted sons, uh, uh, and, which is a source of great satisfaction and a little bit of relief, actually. And, um, you know, what am I worried about? That they're, that they're going to graduate. Well, two are out in the world, one's still in college, that they're going to graduate, you know, come home, sleep in the basement, play video games, and hit the bong. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's, the, that's the fear of many, many parents is that their kids will not be employable, right? The world has gone flat. Um, we're in competition with Asia. We're in competition with India. Um, and how do we make sure that our kids are really able to compete? So I want to tell you a story that threw a lot of light on that question for me. I was on a panel with um, one of the head engineers of NASA, and that was quite an honor, actually. And um, he was a guy from India. And so I got to ask him the questions, you know, that I get asked a lot, like, are we really losing? You know, are our kids not doing well? You know, are you taking all the kids from Asia or from India and our kids will all be unemployed? And his answer was profoundly interesting to me. He said, in terms of content, American kids were as good as anybody. Um, they knew their content really well. But in terms of a sense of entitlement, they were they were the most entitled of any group of kids he worked with. They expected raises uh, before they ever got their hands dirty. Um, and they also needed help all the time. So the kind of collaborative work that is absolutely mandatory in the 21st century, like the problems are so complex and never going to be solved by one guy sitting in an office, you know, with a bolt of lightning hitting him. It's going to be collaborative work across time zones, across cultures. And he said that's where American kids 
suck, as he said. Um, that they that they don't that they need the kind of constant extrinsic reinforcement that no business now because businesses have to be lean have the resources for. And he told me about a kid who, when he said to him, "You will get a yearly evaluation," he said the kid went crazy and said, "What do you mean yearly? I need you to tell me like every day how I'm doing." Um, and, and he said that's kind of a typical thing. So our, we have a reason to be concerned about how our kids are going to do, but we're concerned with the wrong things. We're paying all attention to content, which I mean, I'm down by Silicon Valley, so I get to talk to a lot of people. You know, the content is rolling over and rolling over and rolling over. My youngest kid was in engineering, and they told him by the time you graduate, this will all be obsolete. But the kinds of skills that are really necessary, collaboration, creativity, thinking outside the box, those things are, are getting um, short shrift because we're so anxious about grades. Um, and grades are something that are easy to measure, right? They're just easy to measure. And they let us know how we're doing as parents. Um, so all those bumper stickers, you know, my child is an A student, and my child can kick your A student's ass, and you know, all these, all, all these bumper stickers about how well your child is or isn't doing is an easy way to tell the world how you're doing as a parent, right? Because we don't have the kind of safety nets that parents have always had, right? Mom doesn't live down the block, and the rabbi or the priest doesn't stop by to see if you're having difficulty anymore. So we're, I believe we're kind of on our own. And because we're on our own, and many women have gone back to work, um, that there is a little bit of, um, as opposed to ourselves being collaborative, there's a tremendous amount of competition among parents. Um, <laughs> there's a, a fancy little um, uh, grocery store where I live called the Woodlands. See, I, can, I can't tell this in my own neighborhood. And um, when my kids went to the school right across the street, all the moms would get, you know, drop the kids off um, because we lived a block away. And we, <laughs> we would drop the kids off, and then we'd all go have a latte because um, we liked being as stereotypical as possible about being a, a Marinite. And you'd wait on this line, and I'd hear all these mothers talking about how terrific their family was. Oh, we get along so well, and the kids love each other, and they can't wait to go on vacation. And Yes, he got into Stanford and Harvard, and he's trying to figure out where to go. And I'm like, I see your kids. They are really fucked up. I'm sorry. <laughs> At least I'm not in a church. <laughs> you know, they're having problems, and I know they're having problems. <laughs> and that, that, that's the kind of confidence. <laughs> I can't believe I said that. Um, that <laughs> that's when I leave my notes on the side. Um, that's, that's the kind of competition that it feels like living in these kind of affluent communities where people are vying not to, not to help each other so much, but to see who's doing better than the other person. So like my oldest kid is 32. When, if he had a problem, I could call my neighbor uh, who had a kid that's a year older and say, um, Lauren's, you know, needs a little help with calculus. And she would say, oh, my son passed out last year. Let me send him over. It felt much more collaborative than with my youngest son, um, who's like 21, and um, there wasn't that kind of collaboration. It, was more, it was, would be more like, oh, he's having trouble. I don't know why, because my son's doing just fine. So, you know, you don't make too many of those phone calls, right? Um, so I think there's a lot of pressure on us as parents, and we, we default to this miserable model of treating parenting sort of like CEOs treat their shareholders. You know, a CEO is worried about the end of the quarter um, and, the, and the return for their shareholders. And, you know, we're like, 
what's your GPA? You know, what's it this semester? What's it this semester? We're always looking at the bottom line. And, and I want, if I make no other case tonight, it would be that we have our eye on the wrong ball. That parenting is not at the end of the quarter. You're not looking at results at the end of the quarter. You're looking at results 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line. Um, I want to read to you my definition of successful parenting. Um, while we all hope that our children will do well in school, we hope with even greater fervor that they will do well in life. Our job is to help them know and appreciate themselves deeply, to be resilient in the face of adversity, to approach the world with zest, to find work that is satisfying, friends and spouses who are loving and loyal, and to hold a deep belief that they have something meaningful to contribute to the world. That's what I consider a job well done. And there's no mention of grades or schools or anything like that in there. And I think, you know, if we were all sitting down kind of eyeball to eyeball, I think that's what most parents want for their kids. Do, you know, do I want my kids to make a good living? Sure. But I think because I have the advantage of perspective, because um, my kids are older, which means I'm older, um, I, I, I can see how um, co-arcted, how thin sort of a metric definition is. And I, and I think I got really interested in this because I have three profoundly different sons, profoundly different. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about them because when they graduated, I have this really clear visual of what graduation looked like for each of them. And it really is what sort of got me going in this whole arena of, of um, you know, if all we care about is metrics, we, we're kind of pressuring very highly academically talented kids. Um, but more importantly, we're marginalizing a far greater group of kids with talents that are not necessarily academic. They may be creative, they may be hands-on, they may be intuitive, they may be interpersonal. Um, uh, I recently spoke um, at something called the Orfala Foundation down in Santa Barbara, and that's the guy who started Kinko's. And um, he met me at the airport, and he was literally like this, Hi, Dr. Levine, it's such a pleasure to meet you. I've always wanted to meet you. Can you tell? I had ADD as a kid. And, and, and it's like, <laughs> really? No, I, you know, <laughs> no clue, no clue. And that's who he was. However, somehow he found out that I liked roses. There were roses all over my hotel room when I got there. Uh, there were roses waiting for me when I could. This guy had the best social skills of anybody I've ever met. And his story was he was never a good student. And that was fine with his parents because they understood that he had these, this other skill set. And he ended up, you know, doing kinkos. And there's a million stories like that. I don't love, you know, people will often say, especially down where I live, uh, well, I don't have to go to college because Bill Gates didn't finish college or Steve Jobs didn't finish college. And it's like, guess what? You're not Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. So, <laughs> it, you know, it doesn't really, right? But there are millions, thousands, I don't know, thousands, let's say thousands of stories like that of people who you go, really? That kid is the one who ended up doing well? Um, when my kids were little, the, my oldest kid had a friend who, whenever they played softball, you know, the kid who just like wanders off, right? You know, it's like, where's Tony? I, he's not at third base anymore. He was out in the bushes finding plants, you know, and everybody thought he was like such a weird kid. Tony's married and happy and is the head of botany at, uh, I think, the University of Michigan. So there's no, you know, it's like expanding our notion about what can lead to success for our kids. And there are many things that lead to success. So uh, I started to tell you about my three kids and their grad this graduation scene. My oldest kid's name is Lauren. And he was, he was this kid, you know, the one percenter. Um, he was a straight A student and he was the student athlete of the school and life came pretty easy for him. The school was great. I had dozens of events to go to, you know, the dean's list, the merit list, the honor list, right? And he went on to a very good school and he became a lawyer and it was like, duh, you know, it was clear that that's what he was going to do. Um, and when he graduated Redwood, my local high school, 
Um, he had stuff all over him at graduation. So right, re they're wearing red gowns, and then they have like tinsel um, for being a student athlete and for being on the honor roll and for be so you know he's got stuff hanging all over. He looks like a Christmas tree or something. <laughs> And um, I'm proud of him. He's proud of himself. Um, but it was, a, it was like, that's the visual of what it means to be the straight A student, you know, the really outstanding student. And there was a lot of recognition for him. Um, and that was, that was my first. You know, and when your first kid is like that kind of kid, you know, a really good, easy, straight A, you, you just think you're the world's best mother, right? Because it's, it's all about you. Well, <laughs> when you have that kind of, and then you have the tough kid, and it's all about genetics, right? Because it's, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's how he walks down. It's very, very clear visual to me. My middle kid, Michael, um, who is now in New York as a, di a director, um, some of the time. So some of the time he's at Lincoln Center, and some of the time he's handing out flyers for Banana Republic, and. <laughs> He was, he was actually a very good student, but he didn't care about grades at all. He just didn't get it. He never understood grades. So I got called up to school two or three times in his career because he'd get a test back, he'd look at it, and he'd put it in the garbage. And so I got these calls saying, your son was disrespectful about his test. And I'd have to come up and talk to them, and I'd come home, and it's like, Michael, you know, don't throw it in front of the teacher. Like, And he's, he would say to me, like, what am I supposed to do? Frame it? I mean, I, you know, I saw my, I'm done. I saw my grade. So he, he just happened to be a good student also, but not as good as his brother. And when he graduated, he had some stuff on his, some of this stuff on his gown. Um, but he really couldn't care less because he took the whole gown and he sewed it up so that it was a suit and he wrote on it and decorated it. And like, so that, that was the creative child. And I got to walk through the back of this high school and see the, um, the I, I get to see the theater here. I got to see the, the stage, the, the set equipment in the back. Um, in a lot of communities, particularly affluent communities, the arts are valued. Um, and so, while there wasn't as much for him, um, there still was a theater and a drama course and a drama a department and those kinds of things. Um, and if, if any of you happen to have a creative child, um, let, I'm going to have a word with you for, for a minute as I'm thinking about my son Michael. And that is that creative children, um, they're, they're not as easy as that straight, you know, the kid that just goes straight and does everything right, wants to do everything right. Um, and this may not be true for your child, but it's my experience that those kids, you cannot change that. You know, do I have hard days when um, after he's had a big gig, there's nothing lined up and, and he's living in his closet in New York and eating top ramen? I, I really do. Uh, it would be a lie to say I didn't. But um, all you can do with a really creative kid, you can, they're like a stream. And you can be a rock. You can get in the middle of it. They will flow around you. Um, you cannot turn that child into a, into um, a lawyer. But at one point, when I was really, when he was making no money when he first moved to New York, and it was about six months, and I said, um, you know, Michael, you've always been so interested in theater. Have you ever thought about the business side of theater? And he said, you're the woman who goes around the country saying, see the child. Do you think I'm getting an MBA ever? You know, and he was right. So I don't do that anymore. Although, am I tempted? Yeah, of course, occasionally. But anyway, so that's the, you know, so he was the creative child. And, and if he was here, he would be very unhappy because they don't like being categorized. So my kids would often say to me, don't categorize me. If I'm the creative child, I can't be the smart child. If I'm the smart child, I can't be interesting. Um, so it's a shorthand, and they're not here. So I get to do it, and I only have 45 <laughs> minutes. But my third kid, Jeremy, was, a, was the most average child in the world. Um, how many people here have average children? <laughs> nice, nice, an honest group. I, I, um, this is, you know, my usual audience size, and um, I was scheduled to give a talk in Marin um, entitled The Average Child, 
and it was advertised, and nobody, nobody, <laughs> nobody <laughs> came to it. So, <laughs> so I'm very impressed with you guys, because in Marin, apparently, there is not a single average child. <laughs> Whereas here, there are, there are many. Actually, we're all, as I was saying in the beginning, we're all rather average in, in many, many ways. And it would be nice to acknowledge as much. So my middle kids graduated the middle person in his high school class, making him the most average child possible. Um, and he was a total hands-on learner. A guy named Sternberg, had, uh, yeah, Sternberg, has something called the triarchic theory of intelligence. He was at Yale, now he's at Tufts. And he's bringing in a percentage of the incoming class at Tufts, and they're doing the same thing at MIT, because in broad brushstrokes, he says there's kind of three kinds of intelligence. There are kids who are analytic. That's like my oldest kid. There are kids who really are creative, my middle kid. And there are kids who learn by, by doing, who are hands-on, who are you know, street smart kind of kids. And, and there, there are a number of schools now who are forgoing a percentage of their class to bring kids in from those other categories. So Jeremy, total hands-on learner. If he could touch it, he could learn it, and if he couldn't touch it, he couldn't learn it. Um, and that was challenging for me because, you know, I've got a lawyer, an actor, I'm a speaker, my husband does a lot of teaching, and then I have this, like, totally nonverbal child um, where it's very tempting to sort of say what's wrong with you, but, but his temperament was just very, very different. And, and he, when he graduated, um, he had nothing on his gown, not a thing. And I got really teary. Not that he was particularly bothered by it, but Jeremy is the child in my house because he was a hands-on kind of kid. He worked uh, in construction summers because it was something he could feel good about. And he used to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning to make sandwiches for his Hispanic, in Marin County, it's Hispanic construction workers, for the Hispanic guys on the team with him because he couldn't understand how anybody could support a family on the 12 bucks an hour they all made. So that's the kid who would wake up at 5 in the morning. Um, and so his strengths were, you know, and I'm proud of that, his strengths were empathy and compassion. He was, he's like a really good person. And when he walked down like completely unadorned, it struck me hard that um, some of the things that are most useful out in the world, who do you want to work with? You want to work with a good person, right? You want to work with somebody who's generous. You want to work with somebody who's compassionate, um, is unrecognized in school um, and often in our communities. I have been at I don't know, probably about close to 300 schools around the country now. And the entrances are invariably the same. They've got the honor roll and they've got the athletic cabinet. And the athletic cabinet can go back like centuries, you know. <laughs> in, in Marin, we've got Gavin Newsom's trophy. It's still in Redwood, you know. So. There are a few schools around the country that are different. There's a school called Wildwood that I like down in LA. There are some schools where you walk in and there's all kinds of things. There is the honor roll, but there's also photography and ceramics and um, uh, HPVs, human powered vehicles, stuff like that. Um, now I must say the school made some attempt to find things for kids like this because these are the boys that if you don't engage them, they're going to be smoking dope behind the gym, right? So the school knew that, uh, so they started a engineering tract, a four-year engineering tract, and like I was so excited, that was a great idea. But they never bothered to have it uh, recognized by the UCs. So for my son, every A that he got didn't count, right? And it was it was partly a reflection of the community, which said. The wood shop does not count. It didn't matter that they learned, you know, CAD, computer-assisted drawing, and, and they learned engineering and architecture. Nobody wanted their kids to end up being a mechanic. We just had a uh, thing in, in my community about having a culinary academy at the school, voted down by the parents. I don't want my kid to be a chef. Uh, they don't make much money. I mean, what's a more useful thing to know than how to cook yourself dinner, right? <laughs> Um, and yet they decided that was a bad idea, you know, one more 
AP class. So, and I want to be clear about something. It's not every once in a while somebody will say, "Well, aren't you being like anti-intellectual, or you know, are you trying to like get away from standards and stuff?" And that's not the point at all. Um, I always say I am a Jewish PhD uh, from New York City, married to what my family likes to call a real doctor, um, because he's a surgeon and. Um, this is not at all about lowering standards or, or not having kids perform academically. It's all about what will be recognized out in the world as being helpful for kids as they march into the 21st century. Um, and I think we're looking at, I think we're missing and marginalizing um, kids with tremendous, I think every kid has a superpower. And I think our job is to find that as parents and the school's job is to value it. Um, and I don't think that happens. I think that many of those kids are sort of left behind. And, I, and, you know, personally, I think it's tragic. But I've also spent almost 30 years now treating kids who have felt like they, you know, they'll say to me, I'm only as good as my last performance. Meaning if I did, if I got an A, my parents are happy. And if I didn't, I feel like they're, they're disappointed in me. And that's sad. Um, okay, so back to why we're so anxious. One part of it has to do with the economy. Let me get my notes so I don't get too far off track. Um, ta -ta -ta -ta. I can't find them. Okay, uh, <laughs> part of it has to do with the economy. Part of it has to do with parental pressure. Part of it has to do with the isolation I think we all feel. I think parents and maybe we'll get to talk about this a little bit later. I think parents feel very isolated, um, and I think it can be particularly piercing in communities where people have a lot of stuff and they feel that they have nothing to complain about, um, so that your child becomes your best bet. Like this New York Times piece on overparenting. You know, I wish I could tell you it was like the most brilliant thing I'd ever written, but it wasn't. It was just this incredibly straightforward piece. Um, and when they called and said it's the most emailed piece in the history of the New York Times, it's like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, that had to be, you know, Osama bin Laden's death or the fiscal cliff or the first black president. It had to be something, not like raising children. And I realized at the end of the day that after we've worried about all those things, we worry about our children, and we worry about our children most. Um, and that's why it was so incredibly popular. And I think that um, there's a need to uh, ha have some sense that we're kind of doing this together, that we're not completely on our own, that we're not in competition with each other, um, and that we can take the time ourselves to raise children. Remember the other side of kids being overscheduled is parents being overscheduled. So I just did this crazy thing down in, um, you know, with the Young Turks of Silicon Valley and, and it was supposed to be about their blackberries and um, because they're on them all the time, constantly. And so, you know, I figure I'm going to go in and really help the moms out and get the guys off the blackberries because it's all guys down there. And it's like, no way, you know, can you give it up for dinner? Oh no, no. Um, well, okay, could you give it up for part of dinner? No. Um, can you give it up when you go out? No. All I got was the agreement that upon waking, instead of reaching immediately for their Blackberry, they would first say hello to their spouse, and then they would reach for their Blackberry. Um, so, and that had to do with the sense that every moment that they weren't involved in work was a moment lost. And, you, you can't raise children like that. I mean, the, the reality of raising children is that you have to be present, that knowing your child in deep, substantial ways takes time, uh, and it takes being fully present. So even if you're down on the floor playing and you're thinking about what you're missing at work, you can't be fully present, and then a child can't really develop a sense of who they are. Children don't start out with a sense of who they are. They get it from your accurate reflection back to them. So we have, to be a, we have to be clear enough to reflect back to our children accurately. And instead what we're doing is being anxious and overparenting. And what do I think overparenting is? I think it has three components. The first is doing for our children what they can already do. You know, that's when your kid already knows, 
she, she didn't notice you doing that at all. She, she <laughs> People are going like this. Um, if your child knows math, um, please don't hover over them while they do their math homework. Yes, they will make a mistake here or there, but they know it. Consider that you've done your job well, which was to shepherd them to that point, and let them do it. And it doesn't matter if they make a mistake or two. You're not the night teacher. You have teachers who are going to correct their, the children's work. And, you know, teachers are the most, for me, I was a teacher, they're the most un, under-respected uh, profession imaginable. They do a great job. Um, don't bother them. Don't call them because your kid got an A- minus and he should have gotten it. Just let them do their work. I really feel that pretty strongly. Um, so, so, teachers, teachers in the house. <laughs> um, okay, so don't do what your kid can already do. That that one's pretty easy. Even though we like sort of step in, that makes sense to most people. The next one is don't do what your child can almost do, and that's harder for people because, like, isn't that what a parent's supposed to do? If your child can't do it yet, aren't you supposed to help them? in education called the zone of proximal development, right? It's the area where the child can almost do something but still needs a little bit of adult help. But I think about it this way. I think that's the zone of growth and coping skills. And because I'm an adolescent therapist, um, there is nothing that matters more than self-control. Um, you have an adolescent, the thing you want to make sure that teenager has is some ability to control their impulses. Because believe it or not, a teenager actually can think as well as you can, which is shocking, isn't it? But they have the capacity to think abstractly. What they don't have is any experience or judgment. So, you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> I kid around sometimes and say, you know, what's stupider than a 14-year-old? three 14-year-olds, you know, put them together and the IQ sort of plummets because they don't have, they don't have judgment. Um, speaking of IQ, this is a totally unrelated fact. I'll get back to overparenting in a minute. Um, one of the things that happens in affluent communities is because people tend to be successful, there's some um, assumption that their kids will also be very, very academic. Interestingly, we tend to marry people with very similar IQs to ourselves. It's an interesting fact. And there is a degree of heritability in intelligence. So people think that if they're really smart, like, are you two married? <laughs> yeah, I just want to make sure that, you know, I, I, I got it wrong once and it was very embarrassing. Um, okay, so like if you have an IQ of 140 and she has an IQ of 145, of course Gal always gets the five more points, um, it's not additive, right? It's not, your child's not 285. <laughs> and, and, and while it's funny, I hear that all the time, people say, but my husband's so smart. And it's like, that's your husband. You know, it's not your child. As a matter of fact, there's something called regression to the mean, which means that it's just as likely, if you're really, really, really smart in that iq -y kind of way, which means you know how to take IQ tests really well, um, <laughs> then uh, it's just as likely that your kid won't be quite as IQ facile as you are because th there's this tendency to regress to the mean. Okay, that was just a diversion. I just, whatever. Um, so don't do what your child can, uh, can almost do. Um, I'm the co-founder of this organization called Challenge Success down at Stanford. And my co-founder, Denise Pope, and I have a running argument about this particular thing. Um, we always ask the question, if your child left their homework on the table and it was a really important assignment, let's say he's 11, um, and he'd been working on it for 10 days, would you bring it up to school? How many of you would bring it up to school? The, the, the majority. And how many of you wouldn't? A significant minority, but, but you're the minority. Um, so, so she and I have a very big disagreement about this. The correct answer, the correct answer is you don't bring it up to school. Why? Because it's what we would call a successful failure. Your child forgot it, 
um, he learns two really important things out of that. One, he learns just the logistics of how to remember things, right? Next time maybe he'll put it next to the door or he'll leave himself a note or he'll put it in the car. So he learns the logistics, but from my point of view, he also learns how to tolerate the unhappy feelings that come with having made a mistake. But he's at school, he's not gonna go crazy, he's not gonna put his head through the wall, he's not gonna cry in front of his friends. He's gonna have to go inside of himself and figure out a way to calm himself down and deal with the uncomfortable feelings he has. And that's sort of the definition, my definition of what a successful failure is, is it's within the realm of the possible. I'm not talking about something like being terribly bullied, something that's outside the realm of the possible, but it's within the realm of the possible. And there's something to be learned. The child who does that, hopefully the next time or the time after, or the time after, will remember his homework. And the next time he's upset, by the way, he will remember, I remember, you know, that day I forgot my homework and I, I made it through the day. You know, he has the memory now of having mastered, of having been able to get through uncomfortable feelings. The disagreement that Denise and I have, my co-founder and I, is she says, you never bring it up to school. Never, if she was saying, you never bring it up to school. I can't help but think that if I was like, in two days I'm giving the keynote in Dallas to the National Camping Association, like, I, you know, I don't know much about camping. And so I'm gonna really need my notes with me that day. And if I left them on the table on my way to the airport and my husband saw them and said, you know, I think Madeline could use a successful <laughs> failure. I would be so mad because part for me, part of being in a family is we have each other's backs. So would I ever bring something up for a kid? Sure. You know, would I do it a lot? No. Um, but so even within experts, you know, there's some disagreement about what you do and don't do. But in general, you want to let kids experience um, discomfort, necessity, challenge in their lives because here's the real hard part of being a parent and um, Pamela and I were talking about this about having a, a sick child on the way over the toughest part of being a parent is seeing your child in pain right I can't tell you how many mothers have sat I see mostly moms have sat in my office and said I can't stand to see my child unhappy and my answer always is, if you can't stand to see your child unhappy, you are in the wrong business. Because your child has to be unhappy in order to learn how to navigate what is an inevitable part of life. So, you know, we've got 500 people here. How many people have never had a divorce, a death, a loss, a financial reverse, a separation. How many of you have never had that in your lives? One. One, per one person. And if I get one person, I'm always like, when you go out in the parking lot, <laughs> please, please, right, boom. You know, it's so like that. <laughs> Just be careful. Okay. <laughs> So that's the reality of life. Everyone, except for one person, in this room understands that eventually your children will face those exact same tragedies that you've had to navigate yourself in your own life. And if they don't have coping skills, they're lost. These are the kids I see. These are the kids who go away to college, have, you know, were, were uh, tiger mommed in, in ways that didn't ever allow them to be independent. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite stories is the dean of freshmen at uh, Stanford tells of girls walking across and she forgets where her next class is. She's a freshman. And instead of reaching in her backpack to get her class schedule, she reaches into her pocket, takes out her phone, and calls her mother in Asia 16 time zones away to find out where her next class is. And her mother tells her. Now, it's a tiny little example, but magnify that a thousand times over every challenge that a child faces. And you have a child with no coping skills. 
Now, if we do that, do we all do that from time to time? Of, of course. Um, when my oldest kid went away to college and I didn't hear from him the first day, I was like, oh, you know, he's so independent and we didn't hear from him the second day or the third day and I'm like, you know, telling my husband what a great job I did. <laughs> and on the fourth day, Lauren calls me and says, Mom, you know that number that you used to call when I needed a phone number? What was it? And I realized it's 411. And I understand why he didn't know it, because I, you know, I can still visualize it. There's a long hall, and his room's down there, and he'd say, uh, I, I want to call for some pizza. And I'd say, don't worry, honey, I'll call for you. So he really never learned how to dial 411. So I say 411, I hang up the phone, and then I pick it up immediately and call him back and say, Lauren, do you know about 911? <laughs> Because then I was really worried. <laughs> so on, did, did, that, did that ruin him? No, of course it didn't ruin him. It made him younger than he should have been. An 18-year-old should know how to dial 411. Um, we do this occasionally. All of us do it occasionally. But to do it regularly because you can't stand to see your child unhappy is to abdicate one of your responsibilities, which is to allow your child not externally to figure out to depend on the external world to tell them what to do, like the kid who needs a, a pat on the shoulder every day, but internally to be able to go inside and, and figure out. And one of the things I get asked often is, well, how do you know if your kid is ready? And it's a really good question, because if I remember raising kids accurately, that was the toughest part of raising kids, um, was the day, how many of you have kids who drive? Some of you, okay. You know, the day that your child says, I'm taking the car to Tahoe, it's like, and I'm taking Xanax till you come back. I mean, I just <laughs> make me unconscious until, because I'm scared to death, right? The same way that we held our breath the first time we allowed our child to cross the street, right? Until they got to the other side, <gasps> right? It's terrifying, right? That was the word you used, terrifying. But that's our issue. We have to tolerate the anxiety that comes with the inevitable moving forward of our children. And we have to have some guidelines. How do you know? How do I know when my kid is ready to go to Tahoe? How do you know when your kid's ready to cross the street? How do you know when they're ready to take the bike around the neighborhood? And I think the best rule of thumb I can offer is you look at the developmental tasks right before what they want to do and see how they've managed that. So if your, your 15 year old daughter now wants an 11 o'clock curfew, she has a 10 o'clock curfew, she's never made it home on time, she doesn't call you, um, you don't know where, I guarantee you that the 11 o'clock curfew will be unsuccessful. But if she has made it home on time, if she does call you if there's a problem, then you know she's ready for the next step. If your kid can ride down the bike, the bike down the street, come home when you call, not fall off, not cry, know where he is, find the house, then he's probably ready to try going around the block. And it's our task to tolerate the anxiety that comes with it. And there will be anxiety, but that's the best rule of thumb I have. So that's kind of this middle area, and that's where I think coping skills develop. And I think coping skills, you know, as a psychologist is, uh, I can't over, over uh, value uh, or overstate the importance of coping skills for kids getting through because if all their stuff is extrinsic, what happens to the kids that I see is they go immediately to drugs because they've never sort of developed enough internal stuff and they're always looking outside of themselves for a solution. You know, we haven't virtual epidemic of depression, anxiety, cutting, all these kinds of things now. And there are many reasons for it. There's not a single reason for it. But I think that one of them is that kids simply have not learned how to manage internally their own challenges in the absence of adult help. And adult help is not always there. So we are, for example, they just did a study on self-mutilation at the Ivy Leagues. 17% of kids at the Ivy Leagues are self-mutilating. That is a really high number. 25% um, are substance abusing, not using. 25% meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder or depression. And there's a lot of comorbidity there, so you know I could keep giving you numbers and they'd add up to 2,000. But 
you know, the kid who cuts and drinks and is depressed, that often goes together. The third part of overparenting, which is the toughest part, um, I think has to do with the inability to tell the difference between our child's needs and our own needs. Um, and this is the hardest part because it calls us to account for things in our own life, I think, that aren't going as well as they might be. So I have a dad and a son in my office. I know them very well. They're not crazy. Um, the kid has played lacrosse with my youngest son for years, and they're there to discuss college choice for uh, the son. And he's a really, really smart kid. He probably could go anywhere. And you know, now it's not enough to have your school counselor and the paid counselor. You also apparently need a psychologist also to help you figure out like what's the perfect match for your child. And um, so the, the kid, you know, is kind of talking about where he might go to school. And he starts with the Trinity of schools in uh, California, which is like Stanford and Davis, <laughs> no, Stanford and, and Cal and UCLA or Claremont or whatever. And um, that, that is like, he's like coiled like a snake, you know, and you can tell that his wife said, keep your mouth shut, because he's just not saying anything. And the kid very tentatively starts making his way across the United States, maybe Michigan, maybe Wisconsin, dad's still quiet, and he finally gets to the East Coast. He starts with like William, some of the small Colgate, some of the small schools. And the, you can cut the tension in the air with a knife, and the kid finally says, well, I guess I could apply to Harvard. And this dad leaps <laughs> off the couch and says, now there's a school I would give my left testicle for my son to get into. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes you're just not prepared in life to answer something. <laughs> and that was what, I mean, you know, you can't make this stuff up because it's so weird. And... Um, the issue with that, there are many, to say the least, but the issue with that is, look, this kid's got a million things on his plate to worry about, right? He's 16 years old, he's really smart, he's taking very difficult courses, he's got his first girlfriend, you know, his body is betraying him every day, he's got things happening down there that are like completely out of his control, he's got pimples, his hair doesn't look right, he got cut, you know, that's what being 16 is. He's got a million things to worry about, he doesn't need to worry about his father's gonads. And, <laughs> and you know, that, that's both literal and figurative when I say that. I mean, he doesn't need to worry about his father's concerns or worries or aspirations. For him, he's got to figure out his own aspirations and like everything you know there's a story the father was one of four kids three of them went to Ivy League schools the dad didn't go he was gonna make it up by having his kid go and you know my advice to the dad actually once I could gather any semblance of co coherence was I said you know if it's that important for you to to be able to say you have a kid at Harvard go online go to the bookstore 75 cents you can buy a bumper sticker Put it on your car, drive around, not this town, the next town, and leave your kid out of it, right? Because that's your issue. And, you know, if, if you take one thing away from tonight, it's go home and think about, like, when you sound crazy. Like, am, am I the only person? Like, I, I used to sound crazy. How many people sound crazy sometimes? Those of you who are not raising your hands are lying. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you an example of um, a time I sounded crazy. And I'm giving it to you because it really is like the, hard work, the hardest work of parenting. So I've told you about my youngest son, who was a very average student. And um, he went into his, he, he, he didn't do well in English because he had a language deficit, and he was going into finals and he had an A minus. This is all the wrong things to do, everything I'm about to tell you. And I'm telling him, you know, I knew you could do it, that's terrific. You're supposed, if you want to praise your kids, praise effort and improvement, not, not, not performance, not the grade. But I'm telling him, you know, I know you could have done it, it's great, you, all you had to do was, you know, step up to the plate, man up, and blah, blah, blah. And, and, then he goes in and he takes the final and he ends up with a B plus in the class, which for him was really a very good grade. And I go crazy. 
I go crazy. I'm screaming at him. I knew you couldn't do it. You're a slacker. You never can get, I mean, it's just, it, it is abysmal. He's on the bed. He's got the covers over his head crying. <laughs> I'm crying. I mean, it was very, very painful. And I knew that I had to get out of the room, that I was, you know, I had a, you can tell I have a soft spot for this kid. I had a very close, have a very close relationship with him, and I knew I was blowing it in that minute of going after him personally. That's breaking a boundary, a psychological boundary. So I get out of the room, and I go into the bathroom, and I look at myself. I've got tears all over the place. And my first thought is, you know, I have to call my publisher and my agent. They can't publish the price of privilege, because who am I to tell anybody how to raise a child? I can't raise my own. But then I decided I really had to understand it because I really did know better. Um, this is my life's work, and yet I was totally losing it. Why? And so I went and I talked to somebody o over some time about what had happened. And you know what I ended up realizing was my own dad had died at the exact same age that I was, um, that Jeremy was at that time that this happened at 16, and that. We had no money, we were on assistance. And the only way I got to go to college was I had good verbal skills. And so when I was yelling at him like that, it had nothing to do with him. Like he was going to college and his father was alive and we had resources, but I wasn't seeing him at all. I was just remembering a time when I just didn't know if I was gonna be able to manage. And that's what freaked me out. That's why I was yelling. And I would suggest that often when we find ourselves on the wrong side of an argument, when we hear ourselves being really crazy, that that's what it has to do with, a loss, a disappointment, just like the dad who didn't make it to Harvard with his kid, that those things are profoundly tied to some of our own issues and they get projected onto our kids and we don't make the distinction between their needs and our needs and it's usually for the worst. So if so you have two little assignments you can do when you go home. It's to think about how average you are and and to figure out where your vulnerability is in terms of what you aspire your kids to be. You know, your child is you plant a red rose, you are getting a red rose. You are not going to get a white rose or an oak tree. or that You're getting a red rose. And your job is to figure out how to maximize that red rose. And that means being creative and innovative and thinking outside your own comfort zone. Uh, and I think we're going to talk about this a little bit, actually. And I want to make sure I'm not over time, which I am. So let me just wrap up with a couple of um, solutions. Because when I had three kids and if I took a night to go out, I wanted to walk away with something like I could do when I got home. Well, actually, sometimes I just wanted to get out of the house. But uh, <laughs> so I think there are a couple things to do. You know, one is um, to be very careful about what your value system is. And I don't like exercises in books. I've never done an exercise in a book, but this book actually does have exercises for values clarification because I think it brings into relief. Um, if you say you value health and your child's getting six hours of sleep a night when the American Academy of Pediatrics says nine and a quarter for high schoolers and 10 hours for middle schoolers, um, then, then there's something wrong. With, they're not aligned. You've got a misalignment between what you think are your values and what you're actually doing. So I, I actually think it's helpful to do that. So you, you need to be really clear on values. Um, I think it's really important that kids have chores and jobs and, um, and that they don't get paid for them. Like, when's the last time you got paid for, you know, going food shopping or something like that? That, you know, part, your child's going to go out in the world and be part of a community and their home is their first community. So I think they need to learn to pitch in just like everybody else pitches in in a community. I just got asked in this same uh, Young Turks thing by somebody, should my child learn how to make a bed? <laughs> I get paid for this, you know, it's, just, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what a job. And, and, you know, so I said, like, why would you ask that? And he said, well, you know, we have a full staff and they make our bed, so why, should, why does my child have to learn how to make a bed? And it's like, I, I think you're hoping one day, like, maybe your child will, like, leave the house and then they'll have a roommate or a spouse who will say, you know, what's the matter with you? Don't, you know, make your bed. 
Um, and I find often that kids who are entitled, and it's very easy to brush them off as being annoying, um, really don't know how to do stuff. I had one kid in my practice, she was, it was so, it looked like such entitlement, she wouldn't pack a suitcase, had a, their own plane, and she wouldn't pack, and you know, it's so easy to brush. She had no clue what she needed to pack or how to pack a suitcase. So, you know, these really basic kinds of things, it's very important that, that your kid know how to do them. And the other thing that I think falls into the solution bucket, it has to do with making sure that your life is satisfying. Um, I think we've become unbelievably child-centric. And while there are many good things, you know, there's a lot more communication and openness, um, there is also the single most frequently heard line in my office, which is, help my mother get a hobby besides me. <laughs> Um, kids desperately want to be able to model themselves. We have to make adulthood look attractive. For, for a lot of kids, adulthood, you know what they say is adulthood sucks. Why do I want to grow up? Um, they see us work hard all week long and then what do we do? We go sit in the bleachers, you know, for nine months out of the year and watch them play their, on their select team while we, you know, text or something. And, I think, you know, if you turn that around and think about what if for six months you said to your kids, um, I'm trying to get a lot better at vacuum cleaning. So, you know, for the next six months, the whole family is going to get together. We're all going to watch me vacuum. Right? <laughs> um, in retrospect, I had, you know, three boys, so I had a lot of athletic stuff and a lot of it I liked, but in retrospect, I would have taken some of those Saturday mornings and spent it with a girlfriend or my husband or read a book I wanted to or just maintained my own interests. And I think that this business of constantly being focused and worried and planning around children makes adulthood look unattractive to them, but also saps us of vitality. And, you know, there's a million things that people will tell you to do. The best thing you can do for your child is be happy yourself. Um, and I think I'm going to stop at that point since God knows how much over I am. And um, we're going to go to the second part of the program, which is going to be sort of a discussion. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much to Madeline Levine. Now, like she said, we're going to have more from Dr. Levine in just a moment. Many of you sent questions to our new email address, davisparented at gmail.com. And Madeline is going to answer some of your questions after we set up the stage for Q&A. In the meantime, please welcome the chair of the community-wide K-12 Parent Ed Collaborative, Jody Lederman. Very cool, fantastic. Nice seeing you all here tonight. With a show of hands, how many people feel it was worth their while to come out this evening to see Madeline? Madeline, I think we got more than 500 hands up here. We got two for each. Good, great. Um, next year, we're definitely going to have to find a larger venue. Um, as many of you know, uh, the people who did reserve their seats, um, each one who reserved, we had somebody else who wanted to, um, to join us tonight. And... Uh, there was a waiting list, and I think some people, with, we have some extra seats too, I kind of feel bad, but we really did think that um, we were sold out. And Kathy Peterson, the director of this theater, would not be happy with us if we uh, didn't, didn't follow fire code. Um, so, you know, how did we get uh, this top-notch speaker, a rock star, as they say for Parent Ed, uh, how did we get Madeline Levine? Well, it not only took all of your interest and hard work for our amazing, um, it didn't just take all of you, it, it took our amazing parent ed group, take a stand, you amazing women who put this together. Look around. And up here too. Uh, there is K through 12, we have about, Pam, what, 16 schools? And we have a representative from every school who joins us at meetings on a monthly basis to talk about what the buzz is on their campus and you know what type of speaker um, may work for K through 12, which isn't always easy. But these women 
go back, make sure their sites know what's happening, um, and then again bring information. So it's, it's really been um, a great collaboration. Um, so again, that is the Parent Ed Collaborative is what brought Madeline tonight. Um, but we also also had to raise funds. And um, because it turns out that Madeline actually doesn't work for free. I mean, go figure. Um, the way we've been able to raise funds um, is with your financial support. And join me in thanking the school district, um, our community sponsors, as Pamela said, Chad DeMasi of Coldwell Banker and Dr. Steve Nowicki of Davis Pediatrics um, for their tremendous generosity. However, just like uh, with public, uh, uh, what is it, with public radio, uh, over half of our funds come from you. And you um, who find the value in Parent University. So you all have an envelope um, that our parent ed reps gave you when you walked in. It's a really nice yellow envelope here. And um, take a look at the front, which will tell you how to make your check out to YFRC, which is our pass-through account. Um, or, of course, you can give cash. Um, we have found that a $10 donation per person uh, is typical. And just give whatever you feel tonight's event was worth to you. So um, your parent ed representatives uh, will now um, stand up with their little baskets and you can just pass to your neighbor the envelope. No, you're not in church. And uh, just pass it along to your representatives. Uh, if you don't have, yeah. Like my husband said, just stop talking at that point. <laughs> again, thank you again for your awesome support. While you're reaching into your wallets, I'll go ahead and tell you a few things about our next um, lecture that's coming up in March. My name is Christy Fries, and I'm the parent of two children here in Davis at Cesar Chavez Elementary, one daughter that's in third grade and a son that's in sixth grade. So our next lecture is um, March 9th in the morning on a Saturday, and the topic is drugs and alcohol. And you might think, why would I be interested in that? I have a third grader and a sixth grader. They're not cracking beers yet. Um, but I am really interested, and I think all of us should be. Um, like Madeline Levine was saying, um, she doesn't want her son to grow up and play video games and, what did she say, um, hit the bong in the basement. <laughs> um, and I think that statistics show in Davis that kids are drinking alcohol and starting to use drugs at age 11. That was shocking, shocking to me because my son is 11. Um, and I just think it's never too early to open the lines of communication with our kids. Um, kind of pave the roadways and I think that these um, parent ed lectures give us some talking points with our kids and help us open those lines of communication. Because if we're talking about these things now, when our kids are in third and sixth grade, it's going to be so much easier to talk about them when they are in junior high and high school and they're being faced with you know, situations in which maybe their peers and their friends are drinking a beer or smoking pot. I think that all of our kids, even the kids that are very productive and involved, are going to be faced with this and affected by peer pressure. So I'm just here to encourage you to come to our next event. Um, it's also here in Brunel Theater, and we will have the same restraint as far as who will be able to fit in the hall. So please come and um, help us make sure that our kids are healthy and safe in the future. And um, Kathy? Farnham is also going to speak to you. She has a different perspective. She has older children. So she's going to talk to you for just a second as well. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> I'm Kathy Farman. I'm the Davis High PTA president and also the co-founder of the joint PTA project Davis Parents Do. Davis Parents Do's mission is to educate parents and promote discussion among Davis parents about the prevalence of alcohol and drug use in our town. And I do have two children. One is a graduating senior this year from Davis High, and then I have a daughter who's a junior in college. Um, so the other thing about me is I went to Davis High. I went here in the 70s, and I can tell you I was a really good girl, but my friends were not. Um, <clears throat> In the 70s, I had friends who were drinking, I had friends who did drugs, marijuana, mushrooms, LSD, you name it, they tried it. Um, and most weekends were parties, um, finding out the parents who were leaving town and leaving their house unoccupied, the party was there. If there was no unoccupied house, then we'd go to the green belt or um, out in the country, or I shudder to think of it now, we'd drive up to Berryessa. Um, I was the sober one, and there were other sober ones too, but I was one of the sober ones who kept an eye on things to make sure it didn't get too out of hand. But the point is, my friends were good kids too. They were nice, they were good students, they were athletes, they were musicians, they were in student government. It's not, there's no student in Davis that's immune from the opportunity to try drugs and alcohol. Um, and as my children entered in junior high and high school, I you know, discovered that things really weren't any different now than they were in the 70s. So I knew that my children would have easy access to drugs and alcohol, and that they would definitely have the opportunity to make a choice to use it. So my, my approach was, in spite of everything I might do to teach them to say no, I needed to educate myself. I, I wanted to enter into the teen years understanding what the opportunities were, what was out there, and being able to talk to my children about drugs and alcohol. So I encourage you to come to the March 9th event to learn what's happening in our community and how to get some tips to talk not just to your children but to other parents in the community about the use of drugs and alcohol in our community. We hope to see you and um, you can register on it same. We have a new Okay, so you have the information, but you do need to register again and get your ticket. So thank you very much. We hope to see you on March 9th. Please welcome back to the stage our guest, Dr. Madeline Levine. Let me just get my cards. Oh, never mind. <laughs> All right, now many of you sent questions to our new email address, davisparented at gmail.com. Madeline is going to answer um, some of those questions right now. Thank you to you as well for sending in all of these um, really great questions. Um, I think the first one's really going to strike a chord for a lot of folks. What recommendations do you have, Dr. Levine, for communicating? with a highly introverted child or adolescent, especially if you're an extroverted parent? I'm going to take the word highly out of that okay. for a moment because, um, you know, it brings highly introverted, so like maybe it's depression or spectrum disorders or something, but um, uh, being introverted or extroverted is temperament. And um, we're all born with a temperament and um, unfortunately, temperament actually stays very consistent over the course of a lifetime, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, so, you know, part of this whole issue of seeing who your child really is mm -hmm. um, and then having a big enough heart to, to embrace who that kid is, is um, harder when your child's temperament is very different. So it was, it e you know, you've heard about my kids a lot. It Was it easier to relate to the talkative child? Sure. But actually the opportunity for growth in some ways is greater with the child who's different from you. Um, and it's an incredible uh, gift to be able to see the world through 
the eyes of somebody who's not like you. The danger, of course, if you're an extrovert and you have an introverted child is saying, you know, what's the matter with you? You don't have any friends or don't be a bump on the log, mm -hmm. go out there and stuff. None of which is helpful mm -hmm. um, and just makes the child feel bad about themselves. So it's finding places that that child likes, which may be uh, having one friend and reading or um, with, with my kid who was a little more introverted, you know, I, I didn't know that there was still such a thing as blacks, you know, there's some blacksmiths in California. We took a blacksmith because he liked, hmm. you know, he's quiet and he liked working with his hands. And would I have ever done that? Like not in a million years. So, I mean, I think it's such an opportunity if you can lay aside uh, your preference for your own style and uh, crawl up behind the eyes of your kid. I, I can remember um, I'm a writer, so I go to sleep really late, and that means I wake up late. And uh, my, that creative child would wake me up when the sun would come up because mm -hmm. it was so beautiful, right? And I had just like gone to bed two hours before. <laughs> um, but now I'm very grateful that I got those were the only sunrises I ever got to see. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically, you know, rec recognizing what's temperament, and you're not going to change it, and um, and if the other thing is very introverted, one expects a child to get more introverted in puberty. Mm -hmm. Puberty, you're not imagining it. Puberty, in fact, is the um, most contentious time of child rearing. Mm -hmm. So we tend to think like maybe it's going to be a teenager like 17, but it's really like 12 or 13 that mm -hmm. there's the highest level of disconnection and conflict in the house. But that's part of, you know, that's normal part of separation. So finding a way to relate. Yeah. And let, you know, like, let the kid lead you in that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things kids say all the time is they don't feel listened to. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, especially if you're like, you're like, blah, 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 all the time mm -hmm. with the kids. And um, I think just being available when they feel like talking and actually listening mm -hmm. to them. It's a really good idea. You know, teenagers argue because they're cultivating um, a new skill, which is abstract thinking. So, um, unfortunately, they usually want to argue about things like drugs and um, sex and things like that. But you should engage with them um, if you can do it calmly, because it is helping them to think more clearly. Okay. What suggestions do you have for balancing the many academic enrichment programs that are now available to students and balancing that with my child's stress levels? Your child shouldn't have much of a stress level. I mean, that's not what childhood, it's like we should all go back and read Wordsworth, who described childhood beautifully as a, you know, this like idyllic romantic time where, which doesn't exist anymore for kids. Mm -hmm. um, Usually, you know your kid is being stressed. Children usually show stress uh, with psychosomatic symptoms. So if your kid has a headache or a stomach ache or trouble sleeping, those kinds of things, that's usually the indication that they're being stressed. The value of extracurriculars for young children, is, to me, is incredibly questionable. Hmm. Um, Baby Einstein, which was in one out of every three homes in America that had a, a child under two um, to encourage language skills has actually been shown to retard language development by 10% a month. Really? Right. How counterintuitive? No, no. no. Um, I don't think it is counterintuitive. Okay, how if so? You th you've got a two-year-old. I do. So think about how your child learns anything or learns to speak, right? Mm -hmm. I bet you she, she, he, 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 he's sitting with you? Yes. He's looking at you? Mm -hmm. You're happy? Mm -hmm. with him. It feels delicious, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And contrast that with sitting in a swing and watching a screen. Totally different emotional experience. And one is passive and the other is one not. One is passive, but, but the, the, the biggest motivation for learning is mm -hmm. the connection with you. He, mm -hmm. he wants to learn because he's driven to learn mm -hmm. and you, you just bloom mm -hmm. when you see him learning. And there's none of that with a television screen. That makes sense. That it is a it's a shared experience. That yeah, and and I don't and it doesn't matter whether you watch with your child or not. It's mm -hmm. the eye contact and mm -hmm. touch that mm -hmm. matters. So it, isn't it interesting, right? That like everybody always goes 
like, but this, this research done at the University of Washington has been known for, for many, many years, and it's only this year that Disney actually offered a refund and an apology and had to take the word educational off the video. Mm -hmm. And, and by the way, the refund they offered uh -huh. is you could buy another one of their videos. So oh, okay, come on. <laughs> Not exactly a refund. But, um, you know, I was just talking to a, uh, you know, there was Kumon and now there's Junior Kumon mm -hmm. uh, for reading. And so I, I was calling around trying to figure out what these guys do. And um, I asked one local Kumon, local where I am, like, uh, how young do you start children? Uh -huh. And he said, well, you know, as long as your child doesn't poop in his pants, we'll take him. And I thought, what a low bar that yeah. is <laughs> for, for learning. So, you know, the play is where children learn. I'm not in the least bit convinced that they need much mm -hmm. else than, you know, somebody to sort of watch, mm -hmm. make sure they're safe, give them a good place and a pot and a pan and a spoon and another friend or two here and there, yeah. a friend, because um, it's parallel play. And, um, you know, I, I get asked a lot about, um, like, academic preschools versus mm -hmm. play-based preschools. Mm -hmm. And the research on that is incredibly clear, that three years after preschool, the kids who went to the play-based preschool do better academically than mm -hmm. the kids who went to the academic preschool. It's just not in line with development. So, you know, sort of what you do has to be in line. Um, and, uh, you know, kids, kids learn most everything that they need through play. Okay. So what I'm hearing you say in answer to the question then about balancing enrichment programs and my child's stress level is to take care of your child's health. Yes. Yes. Uh, health and well-being, mm -hmm. you know, uh, physical health and emotional well-being. Absolutely. All right. Um, while my husband, this is the next question, while my husband and I do not put pressure on or even have expectations in terms of letter grades, my fourth grader is upset with getting a B or maybe even an A minus. And I know you wrote in your book that early elementary school is a time when kids start to categorize themselves. So how do we help our doctor take your approach and our approach too, that it is the other things that matter more, that her effort is good enough regardless of the letter grade. How do we help her stop comparing herself to others in terms of her letter grades? Yeah, that's, an, that's interesting and that's, that's become a very recent question. Like when I wrote The Price of Privilege, it was always about the parents. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I am pushing too hard. Mm -hmm. Now people constantly are saying, it's not me. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe it's not them. So, you know, we're faced with this notion that we, we've all sort of heard, what, how, how do children develop? Well, it's 50% nature, 50% nurture. That's what the studies, the research shows. But that 50% that's nurture isn't just us. Like nobody know, nobody has any idea what percentage of how your child turns out mm -hmm. is because of the way you parented. I mean, we can say that statistically, but not for any one child. Um, so there's, you know, there's how you parent, there's the culture, there's the child's own temperament, there's, you know, whether they're sitting next to a merit scholar or the local drug dealer in class. I mean, there's just so many luck, you know, mm -hmm. there's so many things that go into it. Mm -hmm. And temperament. So mm -hmm. are there kids who are more perfectionistic? Absolutely. Are there kids who are more driven? Absolutely. Um, and I think the only time you worry about that child who's driven perfectionistic because perfectionism aside from genetics is is the greatest predictor of depression so you want to watch a very very perfectionistic mm. kid um, but I, I think what you have to do is help the child take the emphasis off the end result and put it onto the process you know Carol Dweck who has just done marvelous research on this and shows that you take two groups of kids and you tell and give them puzzles and you tell one group how smart they are mm -hmm. and you tell the other group nothing mm -hmm. who does better well it's the group that was told nothing mm -hmm. by a lot mm -hmm. and talk about counterintuitive it's like really because like I think I do better when people tell me I did a good job but not so much and certainly not for kids because once you've told your child oh you're really smart to take the next step means they run the risk of, of losing face. Right, of losing face, losing your admiration mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So they tend to stay very conservative in their learning, whereas the kids who have nothing to lose 
are just involved in the learning process and they tend to be more creative, more interested, more engaged with learning. Hmm. Next question is from our Davis parent poll that was done in the beginning of the academic year an overwhelming response of parents had to do with anxiety in students and families. It appears that one area that we carry so much anxiety in that also carries over to our children is to succeed. Succeed has quotes around it. Succeed in that 1% way, maybe. <laughs> Why do you think we as a generation are so worried that our children will not succeed? And do you think this is a legitimate worry? So I, I think I addressed a lot of that mm -hmm. in what I had to say. Um, I know when they thanked people, they thanked uh, the police department. Who's, is there somebody here from the police department? Well, hmm. it's like a shout out to the police department. My father was a, a policeman and um, I just, uh, I was happy to hear that. I was happy to hear, I'm just going to diverge for a minute. I was happy to hear how many different parts of the community came mm -hmm, together. Mm -hmm. um, that's the beginning of changing things is when the community does something. It's very hard to do something individually. Yeah. Somebody says, you know, my kid has too much homework. It's like you got to go find other parents whose kids have too much homework and work in collaboration with the school. Um, we don't. So this is a model here tonight. What you guys have done is really a model for how a community comes together and supports something. Um, in ter you know, you've heard what I have to say about success. I come from this really blue-collar background. Um, it it has so much to recommend itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nobody had money, so you if somebody was sick, you had to go actually help them yourself. You had to go cook the lasagna yourself instead of buying it pre-made. Um, and I, th you know, I read my definition of success. It mm -hmm. really does not have much to do. I mean, I. I, having been a psychologist all these years, I have seen the most successful people evacuated, nothing inside, finished with life. And I have seen, um, you know, people with blue collar jobs who lead fabulously wonderful lives and vice versa. So, I mean, money doesn't either buy. Uh, happiness or or mean that you're not going to be happy. It's sort of neutral. The the research is once you make once a family makes seventy thousand dollars, it doesn't matter if you make seventy thousand or seven hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. um, the, the level of happiness in the house has to do with many different factors, but not with money. I like what you said just now about um, this collaborative effort, not just because I'm a part of it, but because <laughs> we're all a part of it, um, but because it suggests that there is on a, on a larger scale, on a community-wide effort, that efforts can be made right. um, to, to change social norms. Right. That's right. And, and uh, seriously, it is really hard to, to have any of that happen alone. Mm -hmm. but. There's a group in Chicago that I've worked with, and they bring in, everybody's in there. The janitors are in there, the people who, you know, are serving the kids snacks afterwards. And that's how you change a community. So, yeah, you guys are a model. Can I use, can I use you all when I go around the country? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. all right. <laughs> Many of us can name what it means to have our own beliefs and family values, and you talked about being true to your values. But once we start to talk to other parents, open up the paper, we often find ourselves getting caught up in this race, it says. It's like you're talking about the latte moms and how many right. know that their kids are <laughs> effed up. Um, what can we do um, practically, in practical terms, what can we do as parents so that we can stay out of the race and adhere to what we believe in? Um, well, part of it is to be part of it. It's mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. That's part. That's part of what you can do. And and part of it is, you know, Im embedded in that question is something about um, what it takes. Does does it really take something that I'm not acknowledging to be successful? Like, you know, if you go to the top school, will that in some way make life easier for you? And if that was the case, then a lot of my argument wouldn't hold water. You know, it would be short term, like short term you have to suffer, but the long term gain is great. But there's research on this. So people have looked at, people, look, for example, the, the sort of gold standard study was done at Yale. So they took people who were 
um, accepted to Yale, which meant that they were all capable of going to Yale. Mm -hmm. And then they looked at the kids who went and the kids who couldn't afford it or had a sick parent or something like that. They looked at them a year after graduation. A year after graduation, you could tell who was who. Um, so on a first job, it actually did make a small difference. But when they looked at them 10 years down the line, you could not tell the two groups apart. Um, so if you, if you have this like 20 year parenting plan as mm -hmm. opposed to the six month parenting plan, mm -hmm. um, it makes much less difference than we think it does. The grades our children, you know, when, when you're in the middle of these kinds of decisions, right, they all feel critical. Huge. Yeah. They feel huge, right. Um, I can remember when, when I moved to Kentfield, which is where I live, and my, my son had gone to, a, um, to Brandeis Hillel, to the little Jewish day school. And so I was just nervous like everybody, and I wanted to send him to the public school. I had three kids, and um, so I took him to the shrink, and I took him for testing, and the testing said, no, he can't possibly go to a different school. He's got to stay in a small school. He's only going to thrive in a small school. And I didn't listen to it for whatever reason. And he did just fine. Um, it, you know, it was, they were wrong, um, which is not to indict my profession, but it's to say, <laughs> or maybe it is, or you know, it, it's just to say that at the moment, when I think about it now, the money I spent and the anxiety, it's like I can't believe I did that. But mm -hmm. at the moment, it seemed like the most critical decision I was ever going to make, and it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I, th I think that so many of the things that feel huge when we're in them, if we can step back and go back to, you know, what do we want when our kid is out in the world? What kind of husband? Do you or wife? Do you want your child to be? I mean, it's hard when you have a two-year-old. But, <laughs> but actually, I actually think about that, though. You do? I, yeah, I do. I do. I think about, you know, the sort of modeling that my husband and I do, and how um, how influential my own parents' relationship was on me, and what kind of wife and mom I've become. Right. Right. And and so, you know, it, it, I think it just helps to step back and understand, you know, that thing about. Um, uh, how they'll do eventually, mm -hmm. that, that how they'll do eventually is a function of how well you've prepared them. It's a, com it's a combination of their own interests, capacities, talents, um, how well you've prepared them to manage challenge in their life, how accurately you've been able to reflect back in a really positive way who they are, which is, you know, this line, see the child in front of you, mm -hmm. like don't try and make them somebody else, but mm -hmm with a full and loving heart accept who they are. And that doesn't mean don't discipline or anything like that. Kids have to be disciplined. Um, but those are the things in the long run that that really matter. I mean, everybody you talk to, I, my book's dedicated one to my father, one to my mother, just like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. the, what you do is model a way of living to your children. And children end up being much more similar to their parents than different from them. Do you have any final words of wisdom for us tonight? Oh, <laughs> words of wisdom. Um, it, it, there's a part of me that really feels, because I, I think because I'm getting older, it's like life is a party. Um, not every day, that's for sure. Um, and everybody gets to play. And I think what happens um, when you're raising children, you're so busy. Um, there's so many demands on you that you forget that you're entitled to some playtime also, mm -hmm. and you know we know depressed moms tend to turn out kids with really high rates of emotional problems. That um, instead of always thinking in terms of what would be in your child's best interest, what's really in your child's best interest is that you feel a sense of fulfillment and meaning in your own life, both within your family and in terms of your own life, and that. You prepare in some way for the fact that at some point your child will grow up and you will want them to leave the house and you don't want to be absolutely bereft. I mean, thank God we're all living longer and this is my shtetl heritage here. <laughs> um, th that you want to have, th when you talk about modeling, that you want to have interests and things that you can return to. Mm -hmm and that show your child that you know life is really 
endlessly interesting and um, that, that would be, those are my words of wisdom. <laughs> Excellent. We love it. Thank you again my for being pleasure. here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Madeline Levine, stand up and take a bow, please. Thank you. Thank you to all of you who joined us here tonight. Madeline is going to be here signing books on stage. It's just going to take a couple of minutes to set things up. Her books are available for sale in the lobby if you haven't already purchased one, if you're interested. If you didn't get a chance to make your donation in the bucket, there are donation boxes out in the foyer. And we certainly look forward to seeing you at the next Davis Parent University lecture on March 9th. Thank you for being with us. Good night.